Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Investment Management Operations. This show explores the inner workings of the most sophisticated institutions in the industry. Through conversations with executives across operations, compliance, legal, and finance, you'll hear how key operating partners run their businesses in an ever-changing and complex investment landscape. You can join our mailing list and access Capital Allocators content at capitalallocators.com. I'm Scott McDonald, and I'm your host. My guest on today's show is Richie Renneberg. Richie is the global co-head of investor relations and marketing at Takana Capital, a global event-driven alternatives manager founded in 1999 by former Goldman Sachs partners, Frank Brosens and Ken Brody. Richie's career path into the industry is atypical, so I was excited to share his story. Prior to joining Taconic in 2000, Richie spent 13 years competing on the professional tennis circuit, reaching a career high of 20th in the world in singles and number one in the world in doubles. He was a five-time member of the U.S. Davis Cup team and represented the U.S. in the 1996 Olympics. Richie shares how personal connections created an opportunity into the investment industry and how skills learned on the court transferred to the business world. We then uncover some best practices through the lens of a fund IR person. Whether you are engaging with a GP on ODD or monitoring a manager in your portfolio, Richie provides some insights from his 20 years in the business and how to create strong GP and LP relationships. Please enjoy my conversation with Richie Renneberg. Welcome, Richie. I'm really excited to discuss your career in investor relations, but first tell me about your career path, which did not start off in accounting like mine. First 13 years of my adult life, I played professional tennis. I was fortunate enough to do that. It's a long road to get to pro sports, as any athlete, I think, will tell you. I was nearing the end of my tennis career, and I was retiring in the year 2000, and I was trying to figure out what to do. I'm from Houston, Texas. I went to college in Dallas at Southern Methodist, SMU. I was, at that point, planning to go back, get my degree, which I had left early because my junior year, I was the number one collegiate player in the country. And at that point, there's only one direction to go, and that was down. So I figured I'd better escape to a different challenge, which was the ATP Tour. Towards the end of my career, I met Ken Brody, one of Taconic's founders. The other founder is Frank Brosens. And Ken was, I'd say, a little more focused on the business side of Taconic. And that was where I would spend my time. I'm not smart enough to be on the investment desk. And so I moved to Washington, D.C., where Ken was living. And he really trained me, and I spent virtually all my time learning the hedge fund business from Ken and Frank and everyone at Taconic. I want to talk more about tennis. Can you give people a background on your accomplishments? I started when I was about 10 years old. Growing up in Houston, you have to play football. I played baseball, played basketball. I ran track. There was something about tennis that I just loved. I think I liked the travel. My mom had the travel bug and I got that from her. I was a decent football player, but rolling around in the mud in the heat in Houston got old even at a young age. I chose tennis. A lot of my friends looked at me cross-eyed and didn't know why I wasn't continuing with football or baseball or something else. I just sort of followed my passion. I think whatever you're passionate about, you'll work hard at. I had a lot of success early on in tennis. When I was 12 and under, I was the number one player in the country. It's usually the kiss of death. It means that you're going to be terrible by the time you're 15 or 16, or you protect what you're doing well at 12 and it doesn't work when you're 17, 18. But that was something I always tried to not let my highs get too high. That was important for me. I managed to maintain a reasonable ranking throughout the juniors. I think the lowest I was ever ranked was eight in the country. I was lucky enough to go to Southern Methodist University. We had a great tennis team. We never won the NCAAs, unfortunately, but it was a very important time in my tennis career because our team, we all got along very well. We pushed each other. We had a lot of fun, as I think it's important to do when you're in college, no matter how serious you're taking your sport. Most importantly, I had two great coaches. I had, the head coach was Dennis Ralston, who himself was a great player. He was a Wimbledon singles finalist. And John Fielding, the assistant coach, who ended up traveling with me a little bit on the tour after I had made that decision to turn pro. When I got to college, I realized I had to do more in order to continue to progress as a tennis player. I really took it step by step. I wasn't one of these kids. My parents were telling me at 12, you're going to be a professional tennis player. They didn't really care what I did. They were happy with if I was happy. It was really kind of a gradual thing. You go from the juniors, you have some success, you have some failures, you keep going, you hopefully improve, get better, get to college. 
I was pretty competitive all the way throughout. And then at the end of my junior year, when I was the number one collegiate player in the country, a number of our teammates were either going to try the tour or they were graduating. So our team was going to be fairly depleted. Dennis, he was a great person to give me advice and said, if you're going to try the tour, now's the time. So I went out on the tour in 1987, went over to my first two tournaments after the NCAs were at Queens Club in Wimbledon. I had enough points to get into the qualifying of both. I qualified at both, lost third round. My first Wimbledon, I had a third round. I played Yvonne Lendl, who at the time was the clear number one in the world, although he never won Wimbledon. He struggled on grass, but I got to play him, which was just a great experience right out of the gate. What was it like walking onto the grass of Wimbledon as a longtime tennis player? It was nerve wracking. 1987, I believe, they were still using white tennis balls. So that's how old I am. I played a Swiss guy who was much better at the baseline. And everyone's saying, well, you should beat this guy. And coming out of college, you're not so sure you should beat anybody. I won that match. I won a second match at Wimbledon that year in the main draw. I played a British guy who had played college tennis and I knew and I felt like, okay, if this were just a college match, I would feel very confident playing him. But we're at Wimbledon, it's in England. He has a lot of support. I ended up getting through that match. And that's where I came up against Lundell. I'll never forget that day. I remember walking into the locker room that morning, these buddies of mine who are from Australia, I walk in and I'm a little nervous. They say, we've been talking, we think you're going to win today. I kind of fell over. I thought that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Not that you ever go out in a professional court thinking you don't have a chance to win, but it's like coming right out of college and playing Lundell. If I had to bet, I wouldn't bet on me, but it was weird. And I thought, well, hmm, maybe I'm better than I think I am. We walk out of the locker room to the court and the flashes from the cameras were going crazy as we're walking through the tunnel. And that was a new experience for me. So I remember I lost in four sets to Yvonne that day, but it was a great introduction to the professional tour. So you started in singles, but then you actually were well known for your doubles play. My focus throughout my career, all 13 years was singles. Having said that, I mean, in college, I played reasonable doubles. I played pretty well in doubles. But on the tour, the reason you're training morning, noon, and night and working so hard is to be in great shape for singles. That was really my focus. Towards the end of 91, Jim Grab, the guy that I ended up winning the US Open with, asked me to play doubles. And Jim was very balanced. He is a highly ranked singles player, but also really took doubles very seriously. He and Patrick McEnroe, I think, had already won the French Open, and they had won the year-end Masters. So he asked me to play doubles and I was sort of surprised because he kind of knew I was more focused on singles and figured, well, I better try to do pretty well. He asked me to play in two tournaments after the US Open. The schedule used to go to a big tournament in Sydney, an indoor tournament in Sydney, Australia, and then to Tokyo. We ended up winning both of them. It's fun to win anything. And I got a little more interested in the doubles. And then beginning of 1992, I started to have some back issues. The back issues prevented me from playing 100% in singles. So my ranked singles ranking dropped to about 90 And doubles was a great way for me to stay competitive and win some matches, maintain some confidence. I think it coincided with the best year I had in doubles. And I think that was because I was able to dedicate more time and sort of focus towards it. 92 was the year that Jim Grab and I got to the finals of Wimbledon, lost a great match, a really fun match to John McEnroe and Michael Stieg. Then we came back later that summer and beat them in the semis of the US Open and went on to win it. I would love to get your take on what you're doing today with tennis. Are you still playing? I play for fun. I know that the PGA Tour has the senior PGA Tour, and that's still watchable. At tennis players, your body takes a beating, and when you try to play and you're too far removed from the tour, it gets pretty ugly. I love playing. I live down in the Washington, D.C. area, which is where I moved to 25 years ago to be around Ken Brody. I play just recreationally. There are a couple pro-ams and things during the year, but I play probably a couple times a week. The one thing that I'm doing, Ken Brody, among other things that he did in his life, he set up a not-for-profit junior tennis center down in College Park, Maryland, which is called the Junior Tennis Champion Center, JTCC. It's incredible what it's become. It's almost exactly what Ken envisioned and then some. Its main purpose is to introduce tennis to kids who otherwise wouldn't really be introduced to tennis or low likelihood of being introduced to tennis. They do a lot of charitable things in the community, working with various groups, but they've got a high caliber junior tennis program. And I mention it because Francis Tiafo, he came out of there and it was an incredible story. There's been a couple of other kids who have had pro careers or are getting ready to have pro careers who have played there. But the focus has really been to try to introduce kids to tennis, whether they become a professional or not. 
and then try to create a pathway where perhaps they get a college scholarship or something through tennis. And they've been incredibly successful at doing that. Ray Benton, who was a tennis agent back in the day of a very successful and well-known tennis agent, runs the JTCC and I'm on the board of it. So it's a nice way for me to remember Ken. And he did a lot for me. I play a little bit. We have this finance cup. Bill Ackman sponsors the US team. And then there's a European team that Christer Gardell is the leader of. And we get together every year and play a really fun match. One year it's in Europe, the next year it's in the US. That's been going on now for six or seven, eight years. So I do occasional thing like that. So Bill gets to cherry pick the group and pick yeah. you as his well, partner. Well, he picks me as his partner. <laughs> I'm not sure that's been a good thing for him lately. I, my many years in the court is starting to manifest itself in a knee issue. The criteria is you have to be in the world of finance. There are a lot of good players. Most of them are younger, but everyone pretty much played college tennis. Some played a bit on the tour. It's not overly competitive. It's become a really fun event. That sounds like a lot of fun. Let's turn to how you actually got into the hedge fund world. How did that happen? As I was nearing the end of my career, I started to think about this. What am I going to do now? I'd met a lot of people along the way, and there were a couple of people here and there. I thought, well, maybe I'll end up working for him or move back to Houston. I knew some people who had started businesses. I had a chance to maybe work for them. I was initially thinking about going back and getting my degree. And then all of a sudden, Ken Brody was building that tennis center in College Park. And we had some mutual friends in the DC area. Those mutual friends told Ken, well, you should talk to Richie because he's retiring. And they're telling me to talk to Ken because he could give you some career advice. At this point, I think Ken had had a great career at Goldman Sachs. He was in the Clinton administration, the head of the Export-Import Bank. He grew up in the greater DC area, which is what brought him back there. We got connected. I flew to Washington, went over to his house. I remember it was a day when there was a playoff game, a football game. At the time, they were called the Redskins and they were playing a playoff game. I thought, well, I'll go over to his house and we'll probably watch some football and whatever. I go over to his house. I don't even get in his house. He grabs me, puts me in his car and we drive out to the tennis center. He starts showing me how it's all going to be laid out and this and that. And I asked some questions. I went back to his house eventually and we talked about what I was going to do. And he probably wanted me to work for his tennis center. And I told him that I really wanted to try to do something different out of the gate after retiring from the tour. I figure I wanted to teach tennis later. I probably could get back into it, but I'd like to at least try something else. He said, why don't you go back to school, get your degree. So I left and he called me, I don't remember how many months later, three months later and said, you know what? We just started this hedge fund and I didn't know what a hedge fund was. And he said, maybe you ought to think about coming to work for us. At that time, I had a really good connection with the guy who ran the Houston Goldman Sachs office. He and I were friends and we had even talked about me potentially someday working there in Houston at Goldman. I remember talking to him saying, well, Ken Brody called me. He said, you should work for Ken. You should do that. And so I called Ken up. I didn't know what I was getting into. He asked me to go meet Frank Rosens, his founding partner at Taconic. He said, why don't you come here, work? And if a year from now, you're no good at it, this business doesn't grow, you're no worse off, go back to school then. So I did. And 25 years later, I'm still here. I was incredibly fortunate. I spent most of my time around Ken because I am on the business development investor relations side. The fortunate thing for me was that when I met Ken, Taconic was just getting started. The business plan initially was they wanted to manage their own money for a period of time before taking any outside capital. Even though both of them were very successful Goldman Sachs and well-known coming out of Goldman, given what we do here at Taconic, which is mainly event-driven investing, Frank effectively ran that area. So they were well-known. People wanted to give them money day one, but they didn't take it. So lucky for me, I had a lot of runway. I had plenty of time to learn. I hung around Ken and just kind of learned from him. It was very, very fortunate in a number of respects. Ken and Frank being willing to take a chance on me and Ken really pushing that. Then Ken being willing to mentor me. There was a number of years I felt a little like Eddie Murphy a little bit in trading places. And I thought there's probably more than one occasion where Ken had the dollar out of his wallet to give to Frank. I learned the business, the adventure of business, I had time to learn, time to grow our database, go to some conferences, meet people. They already had a head start with a lot of their contacts. Then once we started trying to raise money, it was an easier time to raise money. I was sort of able to have a system in place where we were able to service clients. That's evolved over the years. Did you actually have a job title when you started? I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm sure it was associate, some sort of low-level associate. Ken spent a lot of time with me and he gave me a lot of room to grow. He let me make mistakes. He let me 
learned from both success and failure. And the nice thing about it that correlated some to tennis was that it was pretty entrepreneurial. It was a startup, more or less. Ken could ask my view on something, and every once in a great while, I would have a good idea. You could kind of implement that and see that idea grow. One of the reasons you see some of these firms will hire athletes, there's a lot of things people can do when they're younger that indicate that they have a work ethic. But being a high-level athlete, you're forced to work hard, and that correlates to this business. And that was very familiar to me, so I really like that. You could actually see your hard work produce results, which was kind of cool. Any advice for people trying to get up the curve on working with client-facing roles? Being a good client service person is, number one, being responsive. And it's being responsive both in good times and more importantly, in bad times. I think it's being transparent. One of the things I've been lucky with here at Taconic is that Ken and Frank instilled a culture where investors can have access to senior people. Investors, they hear from me enough. They don't want to hear from me the whole time. So yeah, I'm able to get someone off the desk to provide an update here and there to clients. And Ken and Frank were always very willing to do that as well. You know, obviously you have to know your product. You have to stay up on what's happening in the industry. But most importantly, it's about developing relationships with your clients. To me, it's being very transparent, being honest, and being responsive, probably more important than anything else. Over the years, sort of overseen our group. Right now, I'm co-running it, but I never really felt like I was running it. You hire great people. We all were on the same page. If we made a mistake, let's correct that mistake. Let's send out a revised email. That sort of culture has served us pretty well. If I was giving advice, it's not rocket science. Look at your phone, be responsive, and provide good transparent information. If you don't know something, say, I don't know, and you'll get back to them. Simple is good sometimes. And then talking about the good times and the hard times, going back to the financial crisis, be curious of your take on the tenor of investors and what that was like during that period of time when there was so much uncertainty in the market and you guys had some form of liquidity at some window. Just curious of what that was like. There's some different groups, levered fund of funds that were under a lot of pressure and going out of business, it appeared. And a lot of funds from what I recall, we're throwing up gates. We ran a lot of liquidity models that we were very focused on liquidity. We did not gate people. We ended up being kind of an ATM. We definitely suffered from that a bit in terms of uh, outflows because you know, I remember having conversations with investors. They said, we have 10 managers, five of them have gated us. And so we need to take more from you. I don't remember if we really benefited on the backside of that when things got better, whether they were oh, wow, you guys were great and we're going to give you more money. It was an interesting time. It was a good time because I thought our message then was pretty good. The returns were not great, but we didn't lose nearly as much as the market. We did limit our losses. The redemption stuff, you had a lot of honest conversations with people because I felt like I had developed very good relationships with our clients, so very honest feedback that we were getting. And one of the things about Ken is he was always a very steady hand. It was never a feeling around here like, oh, wow, we're in trouble or anything like that not even close. But we definitely did the right thing in paying out redemptions on time in cash. That was something I felt good about. I wasn't the reason that we had managed our liquidity so well, but it was nice to deliver that message. Also to frame where you are today, like how big is the firm, people, assets, just to give some context? We're a little under $6 billion. We still have the hedge fund that is around three, and we have a private credit business that's around three. We have basically created different side vehicles for each of our strategies, really, North American credit, European credit. We have a dedicated merger arbitrage fund now that's relatively new, and then we have, we have a dedicated real estate fund. And then we have the hedge fund that does all of that. In terms of people, we're about 100 people. We have offices here in New York and an office in London. I'd love to turn to what you think are the good elements of an IR function. The hedge fund industry really has changed a lot. When I first started, it felt a little Wild Westish. That's one of the things that was neat being around Ken, again, and his focus at Taconic was on the business side. We did a lot of things where we would get feedback from investors. That's really an interesting way to do it. It's a neat way to do that. You're thinking about it right. And I think over time, the hedge fund industry got very crowded, got very popular. It's harder to have those kinds of differentiated thoughts or views or ways of doing things that others haven't already thought of or have become the norm. I think certainly it's become a much more institutionalized industry. What that's meant to me is you have to have a really good team. 
even at times I was kind of running the group, I really deferred a lot to our team. We have a great person who heads up all the ODD ops, which has become a critical area dealing with all the back office due diligence. Post Madoff, there was a big uptick in that being what investors really focused on, not surprisingly, but I think that that was a catalyst. Then we have people who focus on redemption, subscriptions, administrative asks. They go out to our investors and we need to have someone at Taconic who can kind of manage those requests. It gets back to being quick to respond, being open, transparent, honest. We have a team that does all of that. It's a necessary thing. It can't all revolve around one person. We have a great team. That's really, I think, the most important aspect of Taconic on the IR side is that we have different people doing different tasks. They all do these things very well. And it's all about providing quick, responsive, coherent, transparent information to our clients. On the ODD side, I'd be curious of what your experience is. So being in the IR seat, what are the elements of a good ODD review from your perspective? One thing we've done over the years, document everything. Let's give investors things in writing before it was popular. From our early days, we had these standard due diligence questionnaire for our investors. Those would cover a lot of the back office questions that we would get asked, counterparties, liquidity lines, trading policies, conflicts of interest, anything and everything. And over time, the industry changes. And lately, there's been the ESG focus. We've had to kind of adapt to that. And it's been sort of a confusing path towards what do people actually want? What is ESG? And we've done our best. We've adapted to kind of documenting our process around different investments and how we think about ESG as it relates to those investments. It's having answers to all of the questions that the ODD back office people will ask when they come in. We have a lot of that documented in writing, keep these due diligence questionnaires updated. And then people come in and we'll have our CFO or our general counsel and director of operations and whoever else sit in with them and answer any questions. Question on the ODD side, you have the initial ODD assessment to make sure is Takana going to make it on the roster. Once Takana becomes a manager, what does best practice look like with regard to check-ins and periodic updates and understand what's changing at Taconic? The initial onboarding, that runs the gamut. People don't know you so well, or maybe they've been following you for a while, and so they have some idea. The initial is much more cumbersome. That's when we'll have to elaborate a bunch on what we have in our DDQ. But you will cover topics, talk about the general nature, structure of the firm, what's the ownership structure, the strategy, the investment process, how does it work? How are decisions made? What's your investment committee doing? Do you have an investment committee? Trading reconciliation, portfolio risk management, what are your limits? Have you ever breached those limits, et cetera? Compliance technology, all of that. How is your data protected? So the initial part, you're covering everything in great depth and you're having meetings, not just with our person in our group who runs ODD, but also with our CFO, general counsel, could be compliance officer, director of operations, technology head, et cetera. On an ongoing basis, typically I have people come in once a year just to make sure not much has changed. And then throughout the year, different investors want different things. We have a lot of quarterly templates that we complete for different investors. A lot of those will just kind of update on any meaningful changes, team changes, et cetera. It's a heavy lift onboarding and then maintenance once a year and then periodic updates that are probably no more than quarterly. On the investor reporting side, you know, as we've gotten more into offering these private credit vehicles, that's a whole other animal in terms of reporting. While I know that there's been different organizations over the years that have tried to standardize reporting because one group might report an option this way or something else that way and trying to make it all apples apples, it's hard because every fund does look at things differently and there's a case to be made for things being looked at differently. And so we get a lot of different templates. Even at times when we've had a standard template to send to people, they'll say, yeah, that's great, but we want ours. There's a lot more work, again, not just on the ODD side, because they're just things you have to keep on top of, but also on the investment side in terms of reporting. A lot of that relates to the private funds. And how do you guys think about, is it true that a lot of people are going for more written material than having a phone conversation? That's been my experience. I used to have monthly calls or quarterly calls with a very high number of our investors. We provide a fair bit of information in writing that goes to our legal department, our investment team signs off. 
I have found that clients really like that. The one thing you feel like you might lose, it is nice to have the human interaction with people, but I still feel like there's enough of that. We correspond with our clients a fair bit, but I would say that the number of monthly calls that are dedicated to what happened this month or that month, they've definitely come down. That has correlated some with us as we send written material to investors. There's less need for a call. They seem to appreciate having stuff in writing so that you're getting it in a timely manner. Saves them time. And I think our information we provide is pretty good. Another question I have is with you offering up some private credit funds. So from an IR function, any advice on what you guys had to do to get up to speed on offering something totally different to the market? The one thing that's different is you're setting a date out in the future where you're going to have your first close or whether it's your second close or third close. There's always some date out in time. The nuance and trying to get someone interested and then keeping them interested for whatever period of time it is, is certainly a little bit different. For us, maybe it's been a slightly easier. It depends on the market, but I say our North American credit, our drawdown fund, they definitely do some things that are different than what's done in the hedge fund. The other benefit is it's a concentrated exposure to a strategy, North American credit, where we've done very well historically. So I think there, the types of investments are at least in the same realm. Europe has been different for us. There are more less liquid opportunities that are sourced differently and are different kinds of investments. You have to be up to speed enough to be able to tell the story. That has been more difficult. The merger ARB fund that we have, the dedicated merger ARB fund, I say that's pretty similar to what we would talk about merger ARB in the context of our broader hedge fund. And then real estate, we are going to be doing no real estate in the hedge fund, and that's really all going to be in a drawdown fund. A real estate equity position really belongs in a drawdown vehicle. And so that's where that's going to be. The differences are, it's one thing to have a portfolio of North American credit or real estate or European credit or merger ARB within a broad hedge fund. Then it gets a little different in terms of risk management and things like that within the drawdown vehicles. I'd say, what are your risk limits in the drawdown vehicles? Who are actually making the decisions? Is there a kind of investment committee overseeing it? Not only do you hopefully benefit from an illiquidity premium, but if you want to really focus on one area, like I said, for us, North American credit's been a very good area. But the longer lead time is a little different than marketing a hedge fund where you could take a subscription every month. It depends on the strategy. And for us, the strategies have been more or less similar, even though if they're not the same investments, they're close enough to where you can get up to speed pretty quickly. Richie, this has been really good. I'd love to turn and close with two questions. And one is any advice you would give to somebody from an operations IR perspective? Number one, you have to know what you're talking about, know what the product is, and also know what you know, know what you don't know. If you don't know something, it's not the end of the world. I think clients appreciate the honesty. If you say, I don't know, I'm going to check on it, get back to you. And then you get back to them. They appreciate that candor. I really think in terms of client interaction, I think it's all about being, like I said, responsive and transparent and honest and kind of open. You're inevitably going to have a run of poor performance or some position falls out of bed. Those are not times you don't want to be calling people when things are going great and never calling them or hiding when things aren't going well. And the other question I have is, is there any reading material, article, anything that you suggest to people? I'm more of a magazine and article reader than a book reader. I remember when I first met Ken Brody, I went to his house and he sent me away when he said, okay, well, go back to school and get your degree. And then when he called me three months later, said, okay, why don't you come here and just see if this becomes a job? He said, I want you to go to the library and get the last 30 years of Institutional Investor Magazine and read all of them. I didn't do that. I may, maybe I should have, <laughs> I, thought, I don't think I'm going to do that. I kind of read things on the fly. I stay current with different industry periodicals and just reading Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. I don't have one book that I would recommend. This is all good. Well, Richie, thanks for sharing your story and look forward to staying in touch. Thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one and see you next time.